Great. So good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us at our Fifth Avenue Synagogue Sunday night uh, lecture series. Uh, tonight we have a very special presentation. We have the opportunity to hear from, our, from Mark Lazary, uh, who works both in the financial sector as well as a co-owner of the Milwaukee, Milwaukee Bucks, a professional NBA uh, team. And we know that uh, sports, uh, professional sports recently has uh, restarted uh, with, without fans, which is really a wonderful thing because it gives people in a time of distress, a worldwide epidemic, an outlet, a distraction, uh, some type of uh, you know, a relief uh, in their uh, difficult uh, situation that we all find ourselves in. So tonight we're going to hear about some of the considerations that were taken um, in reopening and rebooting the NBA uh, basketball season. And there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation and President Jacob Gold will moderate the questions. Uh, but just for the record, there is one question that is off limits. Uh, we are not able to ask uh, what is needed to convince the Milwaukee Bucks to trade Giannis to the New York Knicks. Uh, that's another question. However, Mark, we can make it a very sweet deal. We'll throw in some potato, potato cocoa line filter fish, you know, uh, whatever need, is needed to tempt you. Thank you. Uh, Ezra, Ezra Merkin, the fifth, uh, a Fifth Avenue Synagogue honorary president, uh, we'll now formally in introduce our speaker. We would like to thank Ezra for coordinating and arranging this evening's presentation, as well as this has helped uh, with other uh, speakers throughout our Sunday night programming. And in general, to thank Ezra and Lauren for everything they've done for the shul uh, and our community. It is so much uh, appreciated and uh, please God, only happy occasions for you and your family. Amen. Amen, thank you. Um, welcome everybody and uh, welcome to uh, Mark. I assume everybody is tied in, everybody hears everything, whether they see or not is less important, but I'm assuming everybody is kind of connected. Um, I, I think most knowledgeable observers would agree that the single most important rule change uh, in, the, in the history of the National Basketball Association is the development of the 24 second clock. And what that tells you, among other things, is that timing is everything. Perhaps the second most important development in the history of the National Basketball Association is the three-point shot. Where you shoot from, where you stand on the floor, those shots are not necessarily all worth the same. Some are worth more and some are worth less. So in the NBA, there's a one-point shot, a two-point shot, and a three-point shot. And what that tells you is that location is everything. And so the NBA basically teaches us two very important rules, timing and location, the 24 second clock <clears throat> and the three, the, the um, three point rule. Timing and location are instincts that our speaker this evening has honed to perfection. As he moved from an original uh, stay at R.D. Smith to Amrock, to his own firm Avenue, um, he at every single juncture was at the right time, went to the right place, made the right move, made it at the right time, and was the right location on the floor. Perhaps this culminated in his purchase of a minority interest in the Milwaukee Bucks, a trade that I sometimes call Bucks for Bucks. He took lowercase Bucks and he traded them for uppercase Bucks. And although I think <laughs> the number of lowercase Bucks wasn't so small, I think the uppercase bucks seem to be worth a lot more than the lowercase bucks that he traded them for. I remember tens of years ago, I was in Milwaukee on a trip and in the evening I went to a buck game and it was buck night in Milwaukee, which means, which meant that every single seat was a dollar. Uh, they still had Lou Alcindor and I think he was still called Lou Alcindor. So this is about, this is the stone age in the history of the NBA. Uh, but the value of the uppercase uppercase bucks has, I think, uh, appreciated rather more significantly than the lowercase bucks that he traded for them. Mark has been appearing in an HBO series called Billions. Um, there is a common misconception, I think, that Billions is the subtitle of the show, and the real title of the show is the Mark Lazary biography, Billions, but I just want to correct any misconceptions and make clear that Billions is the name of the show. On, on the show, on Billions, he basically makes cameo appearances, but he always appears as himself. And on this evening, we have the pleasure of listening to Mark, not as a cameo, but as himself. Before I turn it over to him, we all wish him a mazel tov. In the last six weeks, he's uh, had three grandchildren and less than a week ago had twin grandchildren who were born Bishatova and seem all very well and all goes well. There'll be a bris for one of them this coming Tuesday. 
So Mark, you have all of our mazel tovs and all of our best wishes, and we're all looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Very sweet of you. Um, so what I thought might be helpful is, um, you know, to talk about sort of how I ended up um, buying the team. Um, if you think that makes this, that's the right way to get started, Jake and Jacob. Yes, that, that, would be, that would be great. Thank sure. you, Mark. Um, so what ended up happening is um, about six years ago, um, the team was available and we got a phone call from Allen Company to, you know, were we interested? And I was like, sure, why not? Um, I've been trying to buy a basketball team and we ended up uh, starting to do the work and I partnered up partnered with uh, Wes Edens, who runs Fortress. So the two of us do a ton of work. And it's kind of funny, you know, part of our due diligence is to go out to Milwaukee. So we go out to Milwaukee and, um, you know, at the time, the Bucks were actually the worst team in the NBA. And um, we go and there's, you know, on a 17,000 uh, stadium, there's probably like 4,000 people. Um, and it was my introduction to a halftime show that I've never seen before. And once we bought the team, we got rid of it. Um, so what they would do is imagine this. Um, they, during halftime, they take a big uh, plastic uh, sheet and they put, it, um, they put it in the middle of the court. And they have a mom and a dad on opposite sides. And they have a nine-month-old baby. So you had to be six to nine months. And the object of the game was to go from one side of the sheet to the other sheet. And it was literally um, about, you know, I would say 20 feet. And it was called a baby race. And you'd have parents on one side, you know, trying to have their kid's favorite toy. And it's just, I mean, it was horrible. Um, kids are going around in circles. Everybody's doing all this crazy stuff. Um, and that was our introduction to sort of the box. And... Um, we end up, um, you know, at the end, um, we find out we're involved a little bit in a bidding war. And, um, you know, uh, we, we go into this meeting and we're told, look, if you pay, um, you know, $550 million, uh, the team is yours. And the team was making $5 million a year. Or so, you know, we sort of come to the conclusion, look, that's a bit, that's a bit high. So my partner and I, Wes, decide um, that we're going to be smart and we're not going to pay more than 500 million. So, um, Steve Greenberg, who's the partner in charge of this from, uh, Allen company comes in and gives us this speech. This is your only opportunity. And he says, you know, if you pay 550, I'm going to let you guys decide. He walks out and Wes and I go, look, 500 max. We're not going a dollar above. And he goes, yep, you got it. Steve comes back in. Wes sticks his hand out and goes, you're done at 550. <laughs> and I look at Wes, I'm like, wait a minute, we just agreed. And Wes goes, ah, don't worry about it. It's the only way you're going to be able to buy a team. Stop being so cheap. Um, and I'll put, up the, I'll put up the extra money. And don't worry, we're still partners. So make a long story short, I ended up doing the exact same thing where you know, Wes and I split it. Um, but that was my introduction to the NBA. And one of the things we you find is, you know, when you buy a team, um, you don't realize how emotional you're going to be. Um, I thought we were going to be businessmen and we weren't, you know, really what ended up becoming is we became fans and you want to win. And um, so we ended up deciding that to win, you know, you were going to spend literally every dollar you made. Um, you know, and we brought in Jason Kidd and we brought in a number of other folks. Um, and we got lucky in that we had uh, this player that at the time was a rookie when we bought the team, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and we didn't know how good he was going to be. Um, and you know, every time we'd go to uh, Milwaukee uh, before the season started, um, we end up, you know, we'd sit down with Giannis because he was always there. He was always practicing. Um, and I remember once um, I said, um, look, you know, um, I played, um, I played basketball in college. I have, a, I have an idea. He was making a couple million dollars a year, the league minimum, a million and a half. And, you know, I said, if you want, 
why don't we play up to 15? And if I score one basket, we don't have to pay you. But if you can hold me, you know, you have 15 tries, obviously you'll score, but I have 15 tries to make one basket. And if I can score one basket, I win. And he goes, okay. I was like, well, just so you know, I played in college. He goes, yeah, I don't care. Um, and I said, well, I, I just have to score one basket. And he goes, yeah, you won't. And I was like, are you sure? He goes, yeah, just so you know, you're old and I play in the NBA. So I don't think you're going to be able to score. Um, and to make a long story short, I decided that he was probably right. So I didn't do the bat. Um, but we decided to instead play horse. And um, I start and I, you know, I make a couple shots and then he misses a couple shots and then it's his turn. And he goes, um, okay, uh, just 360 jam. I was like, well, I, I can't really jump and jam. He goes, yeah, that's too bad. Uh, left hand jam, right hand jam. And, you know, obviously he won. So, you know, you, you end up really enjoying um, and getting close to all the players. And you end up being, you know, very, very involved in all the decisions as to what you're going to be doing with the team. And I think for us that um, um, it's worked out really well that, you know, we had Jason for a number of years, Jason Kidd, who did a great job. And then we ended up hiring uh, our current coach, Coach Bud, and he's taken the team to another level. And it's a little bit of what Ezra was talking about. You know, we sort of came to the conclusion that, um, you know, we needed a coach who wanted to sort of concentrate on the three-point shot. And because by doing that, it would open up the floor um, for Giannis. And that's really what's happened. And we've sort of built the players around him. Um, you know, so that last year, you know, we had a great record this year, I think, you know, we had the best record in the in the NBA. And, you know, we just started playing again. Um, we had a game Friday where the NBA restarted. And now, um, you know, we'll play tonight, but there'll be about eight regular season games. And then starting August 17th, we go right to the playoffs. So, um, you know, it seems like the NBA has done the right, you know, when you sort of compare what the NBA has done to Major League Baseball, um, it's actually been really interesting um, as to how um, we haven't had any issues. And part of that is the NBA has really, really strict protocols. So um, there's sort of two levels. The players are, um, there's a bubble. And really what that is, is, um, you know, to get into that bubble, you have to test negative. And then you come down and you quarantine um, for four days. And each day you get tested again and you can't leave the premises. You've got to stay in your hotel. Um, you're constantly wearing a mask. Everybody who's there is wearing a mask um, other than when you're playing, obviously. And sort of for, you know, for me, when I went down, same thing, I've got to get tested before I go and you get tested when you're there, but you're not allowed to have any interaction with anybody who's in the bubble. You're kept separate. Um, and you're, again, same thing, you're tested every day. But the, the, the goal is to make sure that we can finish the season and get to the playoffs without having any issues. And it looks like that that's working. Um, so far, nobody has tested uh, positive um, in the last week. And I think a lot of that is because of the protocols. So um, it's actually been very good. Um, so I think, you know, as opposed to baseball, um, and it's harder for baseball because not everybody's in one spot. So that's what's, that's what's difficult. Um, so Jacob, I didn't know, is, are there specific questions you want me to go through or what's helpful for you? Well, uh, can you tell us a little bit, in other words, uh, baseball, the, the teams are traveling, right? Which the Florida Marlins just had uh, 17 players tested positive. There's a question if the, the season will continue. So who, who is the brains behind the NBA to be smart about not doing the traveling and sort of getting everyone in that bubble? How did that process come about? 
Well, it was all me. Um, so I'll, I'll take full credit, um, even though I had nothing to do with it. You know, I might as well. Um, you know, what ended up happening is um, it became clear when we suspended the season was how do you do a restart? And, you know, the problem became that sort of even traveling was going to be an issue. You, uh, you know, where if you're traveling, you've got to stay in a hotel, there's going to be people. So, um, you know, the more interaction you have with folks, the higher the probability is that somebody could catch something. So the idea was let's do it in an enclosed area. And originally it was going to be, um, it was going to be in Orlando and in uh, Vegas. So the idea was that you would have the Western conference teams in Vegas. Um, we would be, uh, and you'd have the Eastern conference in Orlando. And then, you know, you'd sort of have it just in one spot. Um, and then ultimately the decision became um, that you couldn't take the risk that in essence, you'd be playing in one spot and the other spot, um, if there was an issue, what would happen? So you, it, it sort of became uh, easier to do everything in one spot. Um, and Orlando became the area just because they had three gyms, you know, wide world of sports, where it is at Disney World, and that you could, in, in essence, take up all the hotels. So there's three hotels. Um, the ones everybody would know is the Grand Floridian, which is now uh, just NBA players and sort of staff. So the idea was if everything was there, it was enclosed, um, you could control the process, you could control who came in, who came out. And the NBA spent a great deal of time getting everything all prepared and creating that bubble, that area. Um, and I think that's really been the key is that there is no travel, there's no interaction with anybody outside. Um, the food is brought in, um, it, everything is set up so that there's no interaction with anybody. And the protocols are very, very strong that um, e even if you've tested positive, I mean, negative, day after day, you're still walking around with a mask. And um, I, I think that's been the big difference. Baseball, there's travel. Um, the players are still with their families. So the interaction is there, whereas for the NBA, no families allowed. Um, even for owners, when we go down, um, I'm all, only the principal owners are allowed to come. So you've got to be, you know, the governor or the alternate governor. And that's, that's the only people who can come to the game. So when I went, um, when I went down, um, you know, you're, you're actually put in a enclosed area where there's plexiglass all around you and you've also got to be wearing a mask your whole time. So it's pretty strict. Um, so I, I think it's going to work. And I think you'll, we'll end up seeing all these games. Um, and if a player tests positive, um, he can't play until he gets two negative tests. And so even if you have a false positive, right? So, I mean, it's just, it's just how life is. So, um, the rules are pretty strict. Now, I think maybe things loosen up a little bit as there's less and less folks in the bubble. Because right now, if you think about it, there's 22 teams. Out of 22 teams, you're, uh, the max that every, every team was allowed to bring was 35 individuals. So team, coaches, uh, players. So if you sort of think about that, um, literally in two weeks, that'll drop by um, six teams. So you'll have 180 less folks there. You'll start right with the playoffs. And then, you know, two or three weeks later, again, you go half that number. So I, I, I think it'll be pretty good um, and things will go pretty quickly um, where things will be fine. So, so far, so good. And the other thing that's interesting, so, you know, your team, I think, has the best record, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So you would have had home field advantage throughout yeah. the playoffs and the championship. Now you're in Orlando and the number eight spot. I mean, you know, what's the difference between number one or number eight besides the fact you have a better team as far as you're playing in the same arena, right? Yeah. Difference. 
So it's actually funny. The NBA is trying to recreate that home field advantage. So the way they do it is when you're, if you're the home team, the announcer, it was actually really funny because I went, when I was at the game, we were playing the Celtics and you know, uh, you've got crowd noise and it, it is, it's piped in and so on. Uh, but like when Giannis would score, it, w- it would be, and Giannis, you know, screaming, and Giannis with, you know, the jam. And then when Jason Tatum would score, it would be two points for the Celtics, for Tatum. And, you know, it's trying to, it's trying to create some of that energy. It's hard. I mean, it just is. You're absolutely correct. Um, you know, the, there's all these screens, so it's your team colors are on the screen. It's like, it's, you don't have the energy. You just don't. I mean, there's no way you're going to recreate that, but, um, I think ultimately what you'll find is, um, yeah, home court was a big advantage. It's gone. I mean, so I, I think that'll, I think when, I think the better team should always win. I think when you get to the conference finals, having home court would have been a big deal. I think now it's not going to be as much. <clears throat> and I think when you're in the NBA finals, that would have been a big deal and you're not going to have that. So I think that's always worth, you know, what the odds makers tell you is it's always worth, you know, three points, two, three, four points. Um, so in a close game, you're just not going to have it. Um, it's life. I mean, there's nothing you could do. Um, I think people would rather be playing than not. Um, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, it's going to be an issue. So, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the new playoff format. I think this is the first year in NBA history. Usually it's it's eight on each side. Is that correct? And this year you have uh, nine on one side and 13 on the other. Yeah. Maybe explain it and how that process is that because of COVID or that's a permanent thing? No, no, no. It's actually the playoffs are the same. So what, what ended up happening is that um, on the Eastern side, so what they ended up doing was running all these analytics. Um, and the analytics showed that if you were at this point in the season, um, the, the difference between eight and nine, um, if you were more than six games up, uh, there was no probability, it just had never happened that you would end up going from s- behind six games to get to the eighth spot with 20 games left over, something like that, right? So, and on the West, um, you had five teams that were within six games. So that's why on the East, there's only, there's nine, and why on the West, um, you've got, right, 14? 13. 13, yeah, you've got 13, yeah. So, because you had five teams that could that had a shot of um, getting to that eighth spot, so really what ends up happening is your the eighth spot is you're going to have a a game between the eighth and the ninth the ninth spot. Um, so really, at the end of the day, um, it's really Orlando and Brooklyn that are playing for the seventh spot. So it's one game they play, or how does that work? Yeah, they just play one game. So eight and nine will play one game. Okay. And then that becomes the eighth seed. Um, So, like, the Pelicans, who were, I think, two or three games away from that eighth seed, have lost two straight games. So now the odds of them making the playoffs are even harder. Right. So that's what's happening. It was just to try to give – no matter what you did, it was going to be unfair. Right. If you said, okay, season's over, we're going to go right to the playoffs, the team that was half a game back would have said, hey, I could have had a chance to be in the playoffs. You've taken that opportunity away from me. So the idea was, okay, let's do eight games, which gets people in shape, gets ready, lowers the risk of injury, um, and it gave people the opportunity to still make the playoffs if they weren't there. So the actual playoffs will be the same. It'll be one and eight and two and seven. Yep, that's exactly it. It'll be exactly the same way. Got it. So I don't know if you're comfortable sharing this this uh, answer, but you know clearly 
you know, everyone's appreciative the NBA season is back. Anyone that loves basketball like, like we do. But uh, clearly, you know, the, the fans aren't able to go to games because of COVID. So there, there's definitely a financial loss to someone, right? You know, the owners, the arena. So uh, again, if you're comfortable sharing, did, did the players work with the owners to sort of cover that loss or did, how, how was that handled? Um, well, it's actually simple. It's the owners who picked it up. Because uh, <laughs> what ends up happening, if you sort of think about it, um, NBA players um, are paid per game. So if you have a salary, you have your salary and you're, you're paid. Um, so one, there's 82 games. Um, you're paid over the course of the year, but it's on the games that are played, right? So what ended up happening by having an additional eight games, players are getting paid. If you think about it, um, there was only 20 games left in the season. Okay. So um, for, for players, they were getting about 25, they were gonna lose 25% of their pay. Um, by having eight games, you ended up making it that they were only losing 10% of their pay, 10 to 15%, 15 is the number. Um, the real hit, it goes to um, the all the owners. And that's because if you sort of think about it, um, I know the rabbi was kidding around earlier, but if you think of the Knicks, so think of the Knicks and think of the Bucks, um, your floor seats are a lot more expensive than ours, right? So the gate of uh, the Knicks ends up being, I don't know, Six million, seven million, whereas our gate is two million, you know, or two and a half million. So we lost. Um, if you sort of think about it, we just lost ten home games. So if you lose ten home games because uh, there's twenty games left, let's say half of them were home, um, we would have lost twenty five million. You know, we would have had twenty five million of additional revenue, twenty million, you know, whatever your expenses are. Um, but now we don't have that. So same thing for the Knicks. So for pretty much every team, um, I, I would say for us, we were, this year we were going to make money and now we will lose quite a bit of money. Um, and I think that's the same for most teams um, because your, your TV revenue is going to be less and your gate revenue is going to be less. So, so let's talk about that next. So what, why is TV revenue less? I mean, people are home, they're bored out of their minds, they're dying to watch basketball. Uh, so TV, in other words, you can't go to the game. So all the fans that would have gone to the games who are big fans are gonna watch it at home. So explain why TV revenue has to be down. Well, the mechanics of that. Yeah, it's just really simple. We have a deal with our media partners that we struck three, three years ago. <laughs> but said they'd pay us X amount per year. So whether ratings are down or ratings are through the roof, if ratings are down, it's not our risk, it's their risk. If ratings are through the roof, it's their benefit. So um, our local TV contract, we get paid for the amount of games that you have. So your revenue is gonna be lower because you're not having your local revenue your national revenue, again, same thing, you've just got less games, right? So you're supposed to have 82 regular season games and you're not gonna have that. You're gonna have, I think it's like 70, somewhere around there. Um, so even if the, you know, even if the ratings are through the roof, that's for the benefit of the media partner. Got it. So, so uh, you were talking earlier about when you bought the bucks, it was, how many, it's been about three years, you said? Give six it years. So maybe you can share with us, what was the, the biggest positive surprise for people maybe looking to buy teams and what was the, 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 the worst negative thing that you sort of, something negative that you didn't expect to happen? Um, I, think, I think what ends up happening when you buy a team, you think you're owning the team, right? I think you, but you don't. You, what ends up happening is you're like a public trust. You, you're owning it for the benefit of the fans and you that, that that was real that's what i found out right away um 
And then number two, you didn't realize how many people are passionate about the sport. Like it was just, um, you know, when I, I, I would go to games and, you know, you're sort of sitting there, we, we sit uh, courtside and people come up to me and they go, like, I, I, if you don't mind, I just got a, I just got a quick question for you. I'm like, sure. He goes, don't you think we should get Steph Curry? <laughs> don't you think we should get LeBron James or don't you think we should do this? I'm like, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, they go, so how come we're not doing that? I'm like, the other guys don't want to give them up. It's not like I don't want them. And you, you, you sort of find that there's, you know, 50,000 GMs. You know, everybody's got their view. Um, so I don't think you fully, I don't think you fully thought that through, right? Um, you didn't realize how much you're a part of the fabric of the city that, um, like you better try to win, right? I mean, I think if you're not trying to win, it, you know, people get disillusioned really fast. And um, I, I think, especially in Milwaukee, what people appreciate is, you know, once we bought the team, we said we were going to do everything we can to try to make it a winner. Um, we were not going to settle for second best. And you, you, what you also realize is how how much luck plays a part in this? You know, it's, did somebody get hurt? Did you do the right trade? Um, you know, we found out, so I think a year before, I think a year before, two years before, um, Steph Curry was actually traded to the Milwaukee Bucks for Andrew Bogut. Um, the problem was the Bucks medical team um, he didn't pass his physical because they thought that his ankles were too weak. So um, what ended up happening is um, they took Monty Ellis instead. All right. I mean, imagine like, you know, the medical staff had said, yeah, he's fine because he was, but all right. We drafted Giannis in the 15th. He was the 15th pick. There were 14, you know, today everybody tells you, well, everybody who was after us says, oh, I was going to take him with the next pick, right? Because that's easy to say. And everybody before said, oh, I was going to take him, but I got overruled. Like, so, you know, luck plays a big part in it. Um, we ended up, you know, we took Jabari Parker the first year and he was doing great. And then he tore his ACL. And then when he came back, he tore his ACL. So, um, you know, the 76ers, if you sort of think about it, Andrew Wiggins was number one. Number two was Jabari Parker. And number three was Joel Embiid. Well, today, if you redid that draft, you would have taken Joel Embiid. Right? And so luck plays a big part. And um, I don't think you fully appreciate that. Um, injuries play a big part. Um, trades that you tried to do that happened, didn't happen. You know, when we bought the team, I'll tell you a great story. The big free agent. So when we bought the team, the big free agent that year was Greg Monroe. So the Knicks were trying to get him. Everybody wanted him. And so we went up to Washington, D.C. to go get him. Um, I mean, that's where he lived. And our time slot was two o'clock in the morning. The Knicks on July 1st was when you could start. The Knicks, Phil Jackson was there and it was 12 to two. And then we were two to four. Um, I forgot who, you know, and then there were two other teams after us. So we're there and, you know, Greg Monroe is an old time center, like pounded in. Um, and he was viewed as one of the, you know, best free agents available. And I'm there and we're talking to him. We're trying to convince him to come to the box. And everybody's paying him the same amount. So it's just whoever he likes more. So at the time, um, you know, um, somebody starts talking about John Thompson, who was his coach at Georgetown. And, you know, a thought struck me. And I said, well, 
you know, Greg, uh, President Clinton uh, went to Georgetown and, you know, he's a big fan of the Bucks, but he's also a big fan of yours. And he goes, oh, I love President Clinton. You know, I, I love him. D does he really want me to come to the Bucks? I was like, oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, if you want, we'll call him right now. And Clinton was in Paris because I had flown. I was with him, and I'd flown from Paris to Washington so I could do this whole thing. So I go, yeah, he's in Paris. We'll call right now. So I go in the other room, and I call on the phone, and I make believe I'm Clinton. And I go, Greg, this is the president. Are you, are you really thinking of going to Milwaukee? And Greg Monroe goes, yes, sir. You know, I love Milwaukee. I, I mean, is this really you? I go, oh, yeah, it's me. I go, Greg, you know, Mark's a good man. He's a really good American. We really like him. I think, I really think you should be there. So, um, and, and then at the end, Greg's all excited. And then I go, uh, I got to go now. But, you know, you signed with Milwaukee. So uh, I come back in the room and everybody goes, you just missed it. He was on the phone. You know, what are you doing? And I, I didn't even have the heart to say it was me. Um, so I, I take his agent outside, David Falk, who's like the sweetest guy, great guy. And I said, David, David, you do know that was me and so on. He goes, yeah, yeah, no, I know. It's fine. Don't worry. Um, and we had a great meeting. We had a great meeting for two hours. And, you know, we then find out at, you know, whatever, nine o'clock in the morning, Greg decides he wants to come to the Bucks. Right. And Greg, to his detriment, because he was the most prized free agent. So this is how crazy the NBA is. He could have signed a five-year deal, which was the max contract. But he decides, because he's he was 26 years old, he decides that he's going to sign a two-year deal with an option. I think he was 25, right? 25, two-year deal with an option. So that when he was 28, he could sign a max contract for five years. And we paid him 20 million a year. So he could have signed for 100, but he signs for 40 million with an option for the third year, his option. Within two years, it's a little bit of what Ezra said, his game became obsolete. Like you wanted big guys who could shoot from outside, who could shoot the three. Greg could, beyond the foul line, he couldn't shoot, right? And so at the end of, his um, second year, nobody wanted to sign him. So he had to exercise his option. And he exercises his option, we trade him. Um, now, he, so he's not even in the NBA now. He played overseas. There's no teams that want a guy who can only play three feet in. And that's, as much, that's how fast everything has changed. And I don't think it was anything that we thought. At the time, we were like, oh, he doesn't want to sign for five years. All right, we're going to have to pay him a lot of money. And that turned out just luck, right? I mean, otherwise we would have had a big contract that we would have been stuck with. So luck plays a big part in it. I mean, you've got to be good, but I think the same thing as business, you know, in life. If, if you do everything and you do it right um, and you set yourself up, you'll do, you'll do well, but you could do better because, you know, luck will be on your side or luck isn't on your side. Mark, can you maybe share a little bit about your background? I mean, clearly you're, you're a big basketball fan or you went to, you know, invested and put so much time and money and effort. So maybe tell us a little bit, like, were you a basketball fan early on? Like, when did you even think of acquiring a team? And maybe talk about that sure. process. So I wasn't born here. So I was born in Morocco. Um, you know, good Sephardic Jew. You come to the United States. <laughs> I came when I was seven. Um, so I, I've always been pretty athletic. And so when I was young, I just played basketball all the time. Um, I played basketball, baseball, and soccer. Um, and in high school, did well. So um, when I went to Clark, um, it was a Division three school. And I went there, um, mainly I got recruited to go play. 
uh, you know, you'd be a good shooting guard. That was really it. You know, at six feet tall, um, I quickly recognized my time, my chances of making the NBA were pretty slim. You know, some people would say none. I would like to say slim, but that's my view, right? Um, you know, we can all dream and we can all hope. So, uh, you know, what ended up happening is that Clark, uh, our team became too good. Our coach recruited, you know, we went to the final eight for division three. Um, so by my second year, um, you know, I was the last guy on the team and it just wasn't really that fun. So um, decided to play intramural as every good Jewish boy does. Um, and, you know, that was it. So just kept on playing and, you know, played in the lawyers basketball league, just playing all these leagues. And um, I have five kids and my kids were, my boys were really big basketball fans and they played. So we just went to every Nick game. We had great seats, you know, basketball became a big part of our life. Um, and, you know, when I was lucky enough to make some money, I started investing and in trying to become part owners of basketball teams. And I became a part owner of, uh, at the time, the New Jersey Nets. And, um, you know, one of the things you quickly realize when you're a part owner is you want to be the majority owner. <laughs> you know, it's, you want to be the guy making the decisions. Um, it's great to be on the board. It's great to do, you know, to have a say, but ultimately you want to be the person deciding. And um, um, you, you know, if you're lucky enough to have the opportunity to get in and buy a franchise, um, which is what happened with the Bucks. Um, I took advantage of it. Um, I think today, I don't think I could afford to buy a team. I mean, they're, I think every team, you know, the Timberwolves are going to trade today for, um, uh, they're going to probably be for an excess of a billion and a half. One of the things you didn't know, so I didn't know this when I was buying the Bucks. Um, I, I didn't know you, the, what the rules were, which is, the NBA at the time only allowed you to borrow 150 million. Today, the, the amount is 325. So what I mean by that, irrespective of what you pay for the team, the maximum amount of debt when we bought the team was 150 million. Today it's 325. So even if you buy a team for 5 billion, you can only put 325 million in debt. The rest is all equity. So I remember when we bought the team, you know, we win, it's all great. And then we find out this rule. And I say to Wes, Wes, uh, I, I don't have 200 million cash. Like all my money's in the fund. Um, I, I, I have to take the money out of the fund, but if I take the money out of the fund, my investors are gonna get mad. So I, I don't know how we can do this. And Wes goes, yeah, I don't have that much cash either. So I got the same problem you do. Don't worry, we'll figure it out. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and so what ended up happening is JP Morgan, um, shockingly, um, you know, I, 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 put up, um, I put up half the money and JP Morgan lent the other half and they lent, so what do you think they, you borrow money for unsecured? Because you couldn't secure it against your interest in the fund. You had to do it unsecured. So they lent me money at LIBOR plus one and a half. Okay. I was like, wow, I'll do this all day long. Yeah, that, 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 that was a great deal. So that's how we were able to buy the team. We borrowed money and then over the, over a couple of years, I just paid down the, the amount. Um, but today, if you sort of think about it, Joe Sy, when he bought the Nets, he paid 2.1 billion he could only put 300 million of debt. So he had to, you know, he had to write a check for 1.8 billion. It's a lot of money. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot of money you got to put up. So that's what's going on today is, um, you know, these franchises are still selling and people are putting up real money to buy these. Can you also tell us, I know you, you said when you went to Milwaukee, that game you were at, there were, what did you say, 7,000 fans, I think? Yeah, like 5,000. There was nobody. Okay, now you're selling out every game. Every game. You, you watch TV, there are no empty seats. So how, how, did, how, do you, how did you develop that winning culture in Milwaukee? Like, I mean, I'm sure it was a process, not only because you have such great players, but can you tell us a little bit about 
you know, it's a quick turnaround. It is. It's a really fast turnaround. It's one of the fastest turnarounds. Um, one of the things we were told when we bought the team, Adam Silver was great. He sat us down and he said, look, like any business, basketball is all about, you know, management. If you've got a great management team, you're going to do well on the business side and on the basketball side. And I think for us very quickly, you know, bringing in Jason Kidd was huge uh, because it made people realize Milwaukee was a place. It wasn't like a place nobody wanted to go to. It was a place that people wanted to be at. And then the other part was really, you know, one of the things we, I, I, I tried to explain to our GM um, was I, I said, look, I don't need you to tell me to re-sign Giannis. I can figure that one out. I got that. I don't need you to tell us to sign people for the average of what the NBA player makes. What I need you to do is find players that are worth 10 million that we're going to pay 2 million for. It's really that that's that's what a GM should do. Right? Find a coach who's going to end up getting the best out of the players and actually has a good relationship. Jason, I thought was really good in the beginning. Ultimately, the reason we ended up switching coaches is we made decision that Bud, Bud agreed with our philosophy that you needed more threes. You know, so we really went into the analytics. Um, Jason, didn't disagree with it, but that wasn't going to be the top priority. So um, our GM believed the same thing that you needed to do that. So he said, look, I need to have a coach who's going to be on that page. And then you sort of construct players who are going to do that. So if we didn't have Giannis, I think we'd still would have been making the playoffs. I don't think we'd be one of the top teams. I think we were lucky in that we had Giannis. And then from there, we then took it to another level, but you've got to have your business guys and you've got to have your basketball folks on board. And then you also have to have an ownership group that actually is willing to spend the money. I mean, that's, you know, for us, we're at, you know, this year where I think we're a million under the cap. I mean, next year we'll be, you know, we knew next year we'd be in the tax. So you've got to be willing to sort of do certain things. Um, you know, look, it just costs money. I mean, it's, it is what it is. And you, when you're constructing a team, you're, you know, that to get there, you're going to have to get these certain players. Um, and you, you hope you're, I, I think our GM did a great job in getting like George Hill and who's done a fabulous job, but like Dante, um, you know, it was a great draft pick. You know, we had, when we had Brooke, we signed Brooke to the minimum, which was $2 million, you know, and then we were able to sign him to, uh, you know, for four years for $52 million. Um, I think Brooke, by the way, could have gotten, you know, I know Brooke was offered $60 million for three years, but he decided he wanted to win a championship. So I think once you get that winning culture, people want to play for you for, I think, less than they would. Um, but you got to spend money to get there. And, you know, it's the, the problem is once you get there, you got to stay or, there. Yeah, that's exactly it. You want to stay there. And if you're not staying there, um, then, then you have issues, right? So um, it, it's not easy. I mean, it really isn't. Um, and you, you always have to be striving for that excellence. Got it. So I introduced you to my friend Ted Ackerley, who used to own the Sonics, and he's looking to bring a team to Seattle. So can you uh, maybe give us some perspective of, you know, the NBA, the, we, you know, Ezra talked about the, the game changing, you know, the three point, et cetera. But w what are some of the things that you know, as an owner that you'd like to see the NBA go to in the next couple of years? And, and what are the, maybe some of the things that concern you that, that keep you up at night about the NBA? Um, look, I think for the NBA, Aaron, Ted, you would know this. I mean, it's just the, the question is 
how much dilution should you have, right? So should we have, right now there's 30 teams, should you have 32 teams? And, um, you know, from, I, I think that would be good. Um, but, you know, how many, what issues does that create, right? Or there's, if you're gonna have another team, does that mean you get to take some of my players, right? Because it's not, you can't just draft, right? I mean, you're gonna need, so I think you're gonna have that. That's gonna be an issue. Um, I think one of the things you quickly find out of it in the NBA, and I think you know this is, it's funny, you're, you're a partnership. You're trying to win when you're on the court, but off the court, everybody's trying to work together. Um, and, you know, so I think that, I, I think it's a nice uh, group of people. Um, I think it'd be beneficial to have 32 teams. I think it'd be beneficial to have, um, you know, European league. I think it'd be beneficial to have a league in China. Um, you know, you want to grow the NBA and you want to grow your fans. If you think of soccer, soccer is global. I mean, the NBA is getting global, um, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not as popular as soccer. I think it's supplementing baseball, which I think is great. Um, but you know, I think the biggest issues is, I think the biggest issue for every team, you know, to be blunt is um, you got to get fans in the door. You know, so Seattle, it's, you're, you're going to want, I mean, they're desperate to have, again, sort of a team. Um, but you're going to have a challenge if you're not winning, you know? So I think for us, the biggest problem we have is HDTV. I mean, it's just, you know, I got to go sell 41 home games. And when you're winning, it's easy. And when you're not winning, it's not. Um, and it's always the competition. So you know, New York, it's easier just because there's 8 million people and it's 17,000 seat. Milwaukee, it's 600,000 is a population. I don't know what Seattle is, but, um, you know, you got to get that, you got to keep those stands filled. Um, so, you know, I'm all for growth. I think it's beneficial to all of us. Um, I think some owners would rather it stays at 30. You know, to me, if it's 31, 32, it's fine. I don't, I don't think you can go to 40. Like I, I think then you've diluted it. But I think, I think if you add one team now and you add another team in three or four years or five years, I think that's fine. Mark, do you see that going uh, out of the out of the country first and foremost? If there was expansion, do you think it's domestic or do you think it's out of the out of the country? I think it's domestic. I think it's hard. You know, the hardest thing out of the country. I mean, Mexico City, you could do, right? I think that's fine. But you know, trying to do something in Europe, the travel is just so hard. That, I mean, do you, you know, if you sort of think about it, the great thing about if if you have Seattle is just it's the West Coast trip, right? It's imagine you guys going to play a game in London. Like it's it it, it just it's too much. So I think I think you've got to be domestic you know look i know mexico city i think could be an exception i think vancouver could be an exception if you wanted that but i i think it's going to be easier if, i would think it'd be vegas and seattle would probably be the next two cities how do you and the board of governors feel about the league as a whole and its opportunity as a platform on all the obvious social issues confronting the country today and kind of going forward? How are you, how is that being managed between the franchises and the league office? Well, I, I think everybody's in sync. I think ultimately for us, I think the NBA has always been at the forefront, but I think part of that is uh, because of our players. There's, um, it's actually interesting, um, and I hadn't realized this. The, you know, our players, you know, so the collective the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, um, there, there's a sort of a feeling of partnership. You know, so like when we restarted in Orlando, it was very important for our players 
um, that we had on the court, Black Lives Matter. So um, we did that. And the reason we did it is because it's a partnership and it was important to everybody. Um, what you found in baseball is there's actually no trust between the players and sort of the owners. And you've had all these issues. And I think, I think the NBA has been a little bit exempt from that, mainly because it's been a great relationship with the players and, um, and the NBA. And I hope it continues. But um, I, I think so far, it's more of a partnership where, you know, everybody's trying to do what's right for the other side. Um, and I think the players sort of saw that and saw that it was important for us to, to restart and to play. And, you know, they, you're, you're sort of seeing it right now. Like every day I keep reading about a player in the NFL or in baseball who's opting out, right? Who's saying, I'm not going to play. Um, you haven't seen that in the NBA. I mean, you, you saw it, um, just a few players right before, um, and look, it's a sacrifice because people are going down there and they're now with their families. And, um, you know, so people are making those sacrifices, players are. Um, and I think part of it is because they feel comfortable with what the NBA has done, that they've created a safe environment. I think the reason you're seeing in baseball and in football players opting out is they don't feel safe, right? So I, I think you actually do need that partnership, but so far so good for us. I would imagine on the heels of the uh, Lou Williams incident that the league is generally happy that the Vegas option wasn't exploited. Yes, I think, yes. <laughs> you know, the, the, I don't know if people know about it, but the best part about it was the, you know, the way they found out was the rapper <laughs> posts a picture of him. Um, you know, uh, Lou Williams was at, a, I don't know what you call it, gentleman's club, a strip club, whatever you want to call it. So he's at a club and the rapper posts a picture of him and Lou like, you know, like this, right? So the next day he realizes, oops, that was dumb. So he deletes it, but um, other people have seen it. So then he puts out a tweet that says, me and my buddy Lou years ago, I was just reminiscing of the good times. Um, so it was just like too funny. And um, yeah, so he's under quarantine for 10 days. Like it's, it's a strict quarantine. You, he, he's got to stay in an offsite hotel and he's got to stay in his room for 10 days. And if he doesn't want to, then he's not coming back. So yeah, it's, they're very strict about everything. So Mark, before we open the Q&A, there are some questions waiting, but I've already gotten questions in my text. So you said you used to go to Nick Games. Yes. Ezra also does sometimes, or, or Brooklyn. So uh, anything you want to say about, I mean, are you still a Knicks fan or you no. dropped them? No, dropped them like a hot box. potato. The minute I bought the Bucks, I, uh, I became a huge Bucks fan. And I live and die now for the Bucks. Um, you know, the Knicks, look, it's hard. I mean, you know, the Knicks are always trying to win now. And it's just, it's difficult. Like, you've got to have a plan, you've got to have a focus, um, and you've got to say, here's how I'm going to do it. Um, and I think it's hard. I think, you know, New York's a tough place, and there's a huge amount of pressure to succeed right away. I, I think in, you know, look, I think the Knicks probably gave up too early on Przingis. I don't know if I would have given up that early. Um, you know, when they took Carmelo, I got, I get why they did that, but they gave up everything to get Carmelo. Um, you know, and it's hard. Like it's, when, when you're doing a rebuild, if you think of the 76ers, 76ers had a rough couple of years, um, but you gotta be willing to stick through it. And what ends up happening is, um, you know, the press is always writing about you and it's just tough. So I, I, I think it's hard for Dolan. I mean, it just is, it's just, it's a hard city and you know, the, what people want right away is just, uh, they want you to win. So, so you, you mentioned you owned a minority engine in the Nets. Are we able to keep that or you had to give that away when you bought the Bucks? The minute you buy it, you can only have an interest in one team. Okay. So the minute I bought it, I had to sell that interest. So any perspective? I mean, the Nets have been really exciting. They have a new arena. Um, they seem to have a lot of momentum. They just recruited some good players. 
Yeah. Any any uh, thoughts on them or? Look, I think they'll be great. I mean, I really do. I think I think their ownership. Uh, Joe's a great guy. Um, he's got a guy, Ollie Weisberg, who's his number two, who works, uh, who's doing the right things. I think Sean Marks, who's their GM, is a great GM. You know, they're they're building it, and part of it is I think uh, Durant. Um, was comfortable with the team. And part of that is he thought, you know, stable ownership, um, great GM. It, it means a lot because I think today for players, um, it's more where you, where you feel comfortable, where you think you've got a shot of winning. Whereas I would have told you in the past, you want it to be, you want it to be in New York, you want it to be in LA, you want it to be in Miami, Chicago. Uh, those were the cities. Today, it doesn't make a difference where you are because of social media. So you just want to make sure you've got a shot to win. Um, and if the player believes ownership and management is going to do everything to win, he's going to want to be there, right? I mean, I think for us, you know, Giannis is firmly convinced we're going to do everything it takes to win. Um, and now it's up to the players. So, yeah. so, Mark, there aren't that many NBA owners that go on a popular show like Billions. So can you tell us a little bit about how that happened and give us some insight? I mean, you, now you have a Hollywood role. You have an NBA right. owner. You're running a hedge fund. Yeah. Um, multifaceted. Well, I'm just um, – I'm friends with Brian Koppelman, you know, just friendly. And, um, you know, when they were doing Billions, um, I was talking to him about the show. And, you know, we, I, I'd always say, look, here's some of the stuff I do. And, you know, I think Brian talks to me and probably 10 other folks, you know, folks like me about different things of what we do. Um, so, you know, one of the things I asked is I said, you know, I'd love to come on the show. And he was like, great, sure, we'd love to have you. And, um, you know, I, I went on and I got to play myself, which is always even better. Um, the last one, I remember um, I had one line, I was with David Solomon and I said to Brian, um, I, I, I can't do one line. He goes, it doesn't care, I don't care what you can do. All you got is one line. I go, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> you just laugh and you go, Let's, whatever, do what you want to say and, um, yeah, so I got to have two or three lines, but it, it's funny. He's a great guy. He's got, um, it, it's a great franchise, you know, and I think uh, people love it. So, yeah, it's just fun to do. Super popular. Ezra, before I open the Q&A, was there anything uh, you wanted Mark to cover that we didn't cover tonight? I, I had, I guess, a, a question, maybe at one level of abstraction too high, but I'm, I'm curious what Marcus' thoughts about this, which is, um, I might have thought perhaps six months ago, nine months ago, or 12 months ago, that one could begin to perhaps speculate and pick a top in major league sports in the United States in terms of television contracts, values of the franchise, availability of leverage, all these things driving valuations. One of the things that I was surprised by, and it's just me, I mean, I'm, and I have no great insight here, is I was surprised at the extent to which I missed, but but everybody missed sports. It seemed like a, a real national ache. Um, different sports, different things. Um, <clears throat> without getting political, I think one of the few things, or maybe one of the few things that I've ever heard from our uh, national leader was he said at some point he was getting tired of watching 14-year-old baseball games. My question to Mark really is, um, were you surprised by the country's reaction to, you know, to missing sports over COVID? And <clears throat> is COVID likely to bring, I mean, there, there are two kinds of changes. There are, there are changes that are permanent and there are changes that are transient. It's very easy to identify some of the transient changes in the, in the NBA and in sports, yeah. but are there changes that you think might become permanent? And are there, are there implications or trends that come out of the country's reaction to COVID that matter a great deal to the NBA? to you, to the Bucks, and, and to, you know, other major league sports? I, I think what we've learned is, it's a great point, by the way, that the value of these media, right, media rights is even higher than we thought. 
That was really, I mean, that, I that would have been my first guess. Yeah. Yeah. It just, I, I, I would have said to you a year ago, God, I hope, I hope the media, we're going to get the same, if not more. You know, that, that's what I would have hoped when our contract expired. Now I'm convinced we're getting more. Right. So I think that's been become clear. Um, I think for, and the, I think the buyer of that, I don't know if it's, um, I, I think the buyer of that is going to be somebody like Netflix. It's going to be somebody like Amazon, somebody like Facebook, right? Because for them, that value, I think everybody has seen what that value is. And it's gone, mm -hmm. so to me, it's, that's gone up. What I, I think the harder part, by the way, Ezra, is going to be next season. So next season, can we have a season, how we have a season with fans, right? Are you, I know the following season will be fine. But next season is going to be harder just because are people going to be coming in? Are people wearing masks? What, what is the mood of the country, right? Is where are we on this thing? There's no vaccine in January of this year. So therefore, you know, you're, are you going to be able to have fans or are we going to play without fans? And if we do that, how do we do it? Like, do we do a bubble again, which I don't think we can do. Are you going to do what baseball is doing where teams are traveling? Um, we haven't been able to figure that out yet. And part of that is there is a belief within the NBA that things are moving so fast that we just don't know. You know, we'll figure it out come November. I mean, we're, we're planning for all these different things, but it, it'll be hard. So that, I, I think for... Yeah, the interesting thing is that sports is going to form part of the solution because not just in the in the economic sense of a leading indicator, but because sports moves so much of, of social life. I had a conversation today or an email exchange today, more accurately, with some folks at Carnegie Hall who have until September to decide whether they're going to postpone their season past January 6th. And they think the likelihood is that they will. And... Carnegie Hall is one building, but yeah. they definitely are looking at sports to see what they're going to do. Yeah. It's hard. So I don't yeah. know. We don't have an answer yet. So Mark, one of the questions that came in, um, you know, you're a Jewish owner. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Um, New York is, uh, unfortunately, became a scary place uh, recently. Hopefully things will calm down. But uh, as an owner um, in the NBA, have you seen a shift? Um, in anti-Semitism over the last six months or so? I haven't, but it's, I recognize that there could be issues out there. I think for me, I've been pretty lucky. Um, but, you know, so far, um, I haven't received anything or um, it, it, I haven't had any issues, so no. Okay, appreciate that. And can you, there's another question came in about the, was there a lot of collaboration with the players and the owners to get the season started? Can you tell us a little bit more of the details there, of that? Yeah, there was a huge amount of collaboration. I think uh, we worked uh, with the players union in trying to make sure of how the restart would happen, um, when it would start, you know, should we do regular season games? Should we go right to the playoffs? Um, so we worked pretty closely with the players. Um, you know, what everybody was worried about was injuries. So you had a three week period where everybody would train and then you have these games, you know, then you had scrimmages and then you had games. Um, everything's been done in conjunction with the players. Um, I think it's, that, and that's why I said to you earlier, it, it's actually interesting for us, it's a partnership. Whereas I think with, um, with football and with baseball, it's a little bit, it's not as much a partnership. Now, part of that is I think we just have fewer players on a team. Um, so there's less personalities. Um, also, if you sort of think about it, um, at the end of the day, uh, there's always sort of, you know, especially on a basketball team, two or three players who drive that team. So as long as they were on board, you know, if LeBron James, um, Anthony Davis, Giannis, and a couple other players said, don't care what you're doing, we have no interest, 
there wouldn't have been a restart, right? So I, I think I, I think the players were very much on board. So um, and we everything was done in conjunction with them. Great. Can you talk about the? I think the NBA draft would usually be around. When is the NBA draft on a normal year? June, right? Yeah. So we're already late. So so w w what's the process about this year's NBA draft? Is it? Is, It'll be right after the season. Okay. Um, right after the season is over. Um, so, to be honest with you, I don't even know the exact date. Um, you know, the look. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a hard draft because you didn't you didn't have March Madness. You didn't have a lot of games. Um, you can't really. You, you have players who are coming to work out for you. But it, you're not having every player work out, so it's it's kind of tough. Um, it, it'll be an interesting draft. You, your GM better be really good this time. When you say they're working out, they're, they're not going to Orlando. They're no, no, they'll come to our practice facility. But got some it. players won't come because you got to get on a plane, you got to fly. So yeah, it's whoever whoever is willing to show up. So this could be your your this could be a real lucky year. You could end up. Yeah. Either um, we'll, yeah, we have a great. Our GM, you know, I told him you better get a good draft pick. Now, now to talk about the draft because I know there's been a lot of conversation about that, but the draft picks always go to the worst teams. Is that correct? What, what's the yeah, process right. now? So the so way it is, works is the lottery for the for like the top five worst, or how does that work? Yeah. So what ends up happening to try to prevent teams from it used to be the worst team, like the way it is in the NFL, the worst team has the first pick. Okay. Right. The NBA used to be like that, and then it changed and said that the worst team had a 25% probability of having the first pick. Um, now it's been reduced to around 10 or 15%. So if you're the worst team, you can't have anything worse than the, for, the fourth pick. Right. So it just it goes down so that there's no incentive to try to be the worst team. And then it's a lottery. And so what ends up happening is you have 16 teams um, who make the playoffs. So those teams, so if we win the championship, we're the 30th pick, then 29, right? Uh -huh. And then the, then the lottery is the first 14. And that's done. So I think after the first, yeah, I, I think like if you're the 14th worst team, you have like a half a percent probability of being the first pick, right? So it's all probability weighted. Um, but usually what ends up happening is by the sixth or seventh pick, it's pretty much because it's like 95% uh, probability that you, you've got a 5% shot of, of moving up. Mm -hmm. So it usually stays, it's only for the first three or four picks. Where it so makes are it you work. comfortable because I know there's been discussion about teams that sort of give up the year and they say, you know, close down, we're going to shoot for the, the draft. Are you comfortable with that? Or does that take away from competitiveness? You know, yeah, look, I want to compete all the time. I mean, that's just, you know, when we bought the team, I had no interest in trying to be bad. I think that brings about a bad culture. That's really it. It's not a good culture. I think you always want to win. Uh, you want to try to win. Um, but the way you win, you know, the problem is the way you win is you, you know, there's a thing that the first three draft picks, the top three players in a draft, uh, there's a, I think it's a 33%, what was it? I, th I think it's somewhere around there, 33% probability they will be an NBA starter. Um, and then like a, 10 or 20% probability they'll be like an all-star, something like that. So the, the further down you go, the worse the odds are. So if you're a second round draft pick, there's a 1% probability that you will uh, be an all-star, right? But everybody always talks about, you know, uh, Draymond Green or guys who were, you know, in the second round. But um, so the, that's why sort of some teams will say, okay, well, we give up because the way we'll get better is through the draft. I get that. But, you know, I, I think for us, as long as we own the team, we're always going to try to win. All right. What are your thoughts on these? The, the new thing in the NBA, I think, is the players working together to play together, which I think has changed over the last decade. Do you have any 
thoughts on that? I mean, it's a reality, but do you have any Look, opinions? My, my view is everybody can do whatever they want. Okay. You know, like it's, I, you know, if I want to go work for Ezra, I should be able to go work for Ezra if, you know, now, now, can Ezra pay me what I want? That's different. But if I, if it's me and my three friends and we want to go They'll work. They'll pay you whatever you want after this. All right. Talk. So, but if, so the, the thing that limits what players can do is the salary cap, right? So look, if you're all free agents, it doesn't really make a difference. My salary cap is X. I can't pay each of you $50 million. You know, if you think of what the Lakers did, Lakers brought Anthony Davis but then that left them with just minimum contracts for the rest of the guys. So, you know, does that work? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. But I think at the end of the day, players, if they want to play together, it's great. But what everybody quickly realizes, you better be best friends. Because the problem in the NBA is everybody's an alpha male and everybody wants to take the last shot. Interesting. Right, so there's only you can have two stars, right? But what, they don't know how to play together. Yeah, but what you know, the, the only reason the Warriors were able to do what they did is because Curry was on a low contract, so they and then the salary cap jumped up, and Durant was able to go when the salary cap jumped up. Otherwise, they never would have been able to do it. And Curry was fine, even though he was the best player on the team, letting Durant be the star. Now, most players are not like that, right? It's not in their prime. They're, they're, they're just not. So I, I'm always like, go ahead. Like, you know, LeBron James, you know, the, the Lakers had a max, had the ability to have a max contract. Kawhi didn't go there. I mean, they, none of the players who could have gone went. You know, they had to trade for Anthony Davis. I mean, it's just... You know, players want to be the stars of their team. Can you also explain for those of us who aren't as knowledgeable? So at the end of the day, it's not just about money, meaning there's a certain salary cap that every team has. Can you try to explain that on a you know, simple yeah, level? Yeah, so just think of it this way. The, you have 100 million, just do 100 million. If salary cap is 100 million, um, a seven-year player, so – can be the max he can be is 35% of your salary. So you can't go over a hundred million. If you go over a hundred million, you pay a tax. So the first 5 million is one and a half times, then uh, 10 million over is two times, then 15 million over is three times and 20 million over is four times. So if you, if you're like 10 million over, you're paying, you're, you're paying an extra $30 million. Right. So it's just, it's a lot of money. So if you're 20 million, it's like 80 million bucks. Um, so most owners, you know, most teams don't make money. You know, you're, cause everybody's trying to win. So you're break even, you make 5 million, you lose, you lose 5 million. Um, so everybody's trying to stay within the salary cap. Like nobody wants to go over the salary cap. And I look, I don't care how rich you are nobody's nobody's excited about writing checks of 50 million a year right you know people didn't make money by losing money so so what ends up happening is there's a limit to what you can pay um so you've got to have 14 13 people on a team um if you if you have three max contracts that's 90 million dollars that leaves you 10 million so that means all you can do is sign people for the minimum. So when you're signing players for the minimum, you're not exactly getting the best player. So, you know, this year there's a high probability, with God's help, you'll be in the championship. Uh, so tell us a little bit, in other words, winning the championship, each player gets compensated from the team, from the NBA. We, we've all seen the ring ceremonies, but what's the, is there like a big financial incentive on top of, being a not winner, really. or that's not what does it? Not really. There, there really isn't. I mean, you've got your contract. Um, you'll get an extra, I think each player, if you win the championship, you get you probably get an extra quarter of a million dollars. But, but, well, that's a lot of money. You know, it is, but if you're getting paid $25 million, 
Right. You know, I mean, that's one percent. So you're not you're playing to win the championship. You're not playing to get um, to get like the extra. Doesn't mean they don't want it. Trust me, they all take it. Everybody takes it. It's not. But I think at the end of the day, um, the goal is to win the championship. Um, that's really it. You're, you know, players define themselves by being champions. And the winner takes all. The, the, the losing team, it's not like the U.S. Open tennis where, where they. You know, the losing team will get like 100,000, something like oh, that. Oh, they, they do get something. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then, like, you think if that number increase would make a difference? And where does that money come out of eventually? It, comes out of, it just comes out of the pool from the media partners. Um, Is that out of the owner's pool, pool or that's just out no, of No, it's just out of the media pool. Interesting. So the media is actually... Yeah, I mean, it's money we would get, but we're not getting it, so it's going to the players. So, so it is coming out of your pocket. Ultimately, the end of the yeah, I guess. Got it. All right, I really appreciate your time. Ezra, is there any, anything you want to cover before we let Mark watch his team win tonight? I just wanted to thank Mark. I, in, uh, if I don't know whether um, Alex or uh, Sophie are listening or any of Alex's uh, brothers and sister and parents, but mazel tov to them on the most recent additions in the plural thank to you. the family. And mazel tov to, again to you, Mark. And uh, Look, I can say something that's easy for us to say, which is we'd love to have you back, maybe on the other side of the championship, the draft and the new season, and you can tell us, you know, how great. things look, because it's a moving target. That's the one, they, if there's one message, that's one of the points you got across. No, so we really, that. really thank you very much for being so good natured about it and for uh, giving us a wonderful evening. Thank you. My and Mark, we, we, we hope to see you at Fifth Avenue Synagogue. So, so uh, this is, this is a recruiting call to get you to come. I'm in. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank Have a great evening, Mark. Lots of love. Take care. Awesome Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.